We have a SAP. Katie Edwards. Meeting, please come to order. <clears throat> Clerk, please read the roll. Adel? Here. Avedesian? Here. Buell? Here. Camilleri? Curry? Here. DeBella? Here. Gardeau? Here. Hall? Here. Healy? Here. Hoffman? Here. Holloway? Yono? Lachance? Here. LeBeau? Here. Lester? Magnin? Maniscalco? Mandike? Murata? Payne? Here. Patel? Here. Salemi? Salmonides? Here. Sweezy? Here. Taylor? Here. Vecino? Here. We have a quorum. We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Approval of the minutes of the meeting of January the 6th, 2020. Is there a motion to adopt? Been moved and seconded. Uh, are there any additions or deletions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Item five. Uh, public comments relative to agenda items. <clears throat> okay. Uh, pub, um, report from the district chairman. Um, one item. Uh, Chris? Yep. Yeah, there's a, uh, a tour of the facilities up in the... Down on Brainerd Road. Brainerd the water Road. pollution yeah. control plant. The water pollution control plant. Uh, Chris, would you give the time? Yeah, I, I was asked by uh, uh, a couple of commissioners to uh, about a tour of that facility. Um, uh, Mr. Tyler, who uh, heads the operation down there, uh, is giving a tour on Tuesday, February 18th. Which is next Tuesday. From 10 to 2. And it's, you know, I'm sorry, 10 to 12, excuse me, 10 to 12, but if it goes beyond that, that's fine. Uh, if you could let us know, either through uh, Victoria or myself, uh, if you're interested in attending, just so we can get an idea on numbers, that would be helpful. Um, Tom, do you have anything you want to add to that, or? That's fine. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we oh, you got to say about wearing boots and stuff, right? Yeah. Correct. We'll provide the necessary safety gear, hard hat, safety vessel, which is required. If anyone uh, is going to participate, we ask that you wear safety shoes if you have them. If not, some kind of hiking boot or work shoes, something like that, uh, just for part of our safety protocol. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom, do, do, we don't have the uh, boots like they have in the tunnel, huh? Okay. No, we don't want boots. Okay. And believe me, if, if you have the time, you should, you should take the uh, tour. Um, when you look at that facility, it's... It, it, from outside of the facility, it, it, it's massive. When you get into it, it's three times the size of what you see from the outside. It's, it's, it goes deep. Um, it, it would be a good, a good uh, experience. Um, Chairman? Yes. Um, quick question for you. Um, are we uh, going to get a chance to take a tour of the tunnel once it's completed uh, or not? I'm just out of curiosity. Well, I, I think once it's completed, that probably makes a lot of sense. Uh, we, uh, I had the pleasure and the experience about two months ago, was it, Susan? Yep. I went down with Kelly and Susan, and uh, we went down, and it is a very scary situation. Um, it, uh, it's a tunnel one way in and one way out. Um, we were having some problems with, with leakage of water. Were we not, Susan, at that point in time? And we've, we've resolved that. Some of the grouting that was not properly done was having some leakage. And uh, that's been resolved. But it, it's, it's a very difficult uh, process in there. And I, I don't think, personally, I don't think it's ready. There's a preparation period that you have to go through 
to go down there. Uh, they show you how to use breathing machines if you have to have them. It's, it's not uh, something that I think at this time we're ready for that kind of, uh, that kind of a situation. But uh, as it improves, and it will, then we'll, we'll do something that way. Uh, yeah. Item number seven, report from the Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, just mention meetings. Uh, as, uh, as I reported at last meeting, we were planning to meet with uh, the town of Rocky Hill at their council meeting, on January, which we did on January 21st. Uh, we gave the similar presentation uh, that we had given to all of, the, all of our towns, a very positive meeting. The chairman, myself, and staff, and uh, Commissioner Sweezy uh, were present. Um, we also have a meeting uh, scheduled for uh, February 20th uh, with Congressman Larson and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers to discuss the Hartford Dyke and the East Hartford Dyke in terms of the status. Uh, we're also meeting with the uh, Connecticut uh, Water Works Association's Legislative Committee to talk specifically about PFAS and, and the agenda uh, for our, the water utilities and how we, uh, and what, are, what we believe is important to the MDC. Uh, the one thing we have to really consider is the MDC is unique. Uh, the other largest water utilities in Connecticut are just water utilities. We're the only water utility and wastewater utility. So a lot of the discussions that are occurring right now regarding PFAS is associated with airports, fire protection. Uh, there's no discussion about landfills and the largest contributor to PFAS to the Connecticut River or to the MDC Hartford treatment plant, which is the largest in the state. Uh, regarding PFAS. So we want uh, legislation to look at not only uh, fire protection and not only airports, but also discharges from landfills into the MDC's sewer system. And what we're looking for is for point source protection. So we're expecting um, anyone who's discharging PFAS to our system that it's treated at the source. And again, DEEP's already proven uh, through their pilot program in October of 2018, that they can actually remove the PFAS below levels uh, mandated by EPA, which is 70 parts per trillion. So that's what we're looking for, and we're going to be pushing um, uh, the utility industry uh, for that. Uh, we also have just been requested, um, as we've been talking about with, um, with our um, uh, stakeholder meetings with our towns is that the town of Windsor uh, and uh, 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 Representative Jane Garraby uh, has asked and the mayor asked that we come in on uh, February 27th to talk about uh, water bills and um, explain the water bill and some of the charges, uh, a clean water surcharge uh, that we've been talking about uh, over the last number of months. Um, I'm also uh, meeting with uh, my NACWA board members and EPA on March 4th. Um, and then we've also got presentations um, to town councils. Uh, Weathersfield, we just uh, presented uh, on the 3rd, and we're going to West Hartford um, on the 13th. Um, something I'd, I'd like to, I'm going to, I've got a lot to talk about, but I'm just going to focus on these two very important issues. I sent an email out to all the town managers and uh, and the, um, and the commissioners and representatives uh, talking about two specific issues, and one of them is the integrated plan, and the other one is the landfill. I'm not going to get into the details of those emails because they're very long, but I do want to make a point. In my, some of my discussions with some of my deep counterparts, um, I, I, they would argue against my position um, in a couple of ways. Um, you know, I made a very important point that the MDC, is the only utility, wastewater utility in Connecticut that has spent $1.7 billion on the clean water project to date, and we have to spend another billion dollars to be in compliance. Uh, so we believe with that we're overregulated in comparison uh, to other utilities. They would argue that, well, New, New Haven and Bridgeport and, and Norwich all have consent orders, which is true. Uh, but just compare, let's compare apples and apples. The MDC has a $2.6 billion program. 
We've spent $1.7 billion since 2008. Uh, New Haven has a consent order 2009. Uh, they have a two-year level of control. We have a one-year level of control. They don't have any eliminations. We have um, nine of our overflows, the North Branch of the Park River and, the, and Franklin Avenue to the Wethersfield Coal are elimination. Elimination costs a lot more money than one-year or two-year level of control. But their program is around $550 million. To date, they've only spent, and I don't even know what the number is, but I know what they've built. They've built a five million gallon CSO storage tank, and that's all. Uh, Bridgeport. Bridgeport has a one-year level of control similar to us, but they don't have elimination uh, as, as we do with the Wethersfield Cove and, and the uh, uh, North Branch. Their projects is roughly uh, 585 million. To date, they spent 30 to 35 million. Norwich. They don't have a level of control, but they've got a number um, a ga of gallons that they have to remove, roughly 103 million gallons of CSO they've got to remove. That budget is estimated at 270 million. To date, they've done, they haven't done anything. So my point is true. The facts are the MDC is the only utility in Connecticut that has been mandated to spend. We're averaging $119 million a year for the last 13 years. And like I said in my email, no one's even come close to spending that, uh, and those are facts. Uh, I've, I've compared ourselves with Boston. So I've said this numerous times. Boston is about the same size as the MDC. Uh, there's 600,000 customers. We're 400,000, I'm sorry, 600,000 population served. We're 400,000 population served. We've got 102,000 customers. But I've compared ourselves because in the size, they've spent about $500 million on their CSO program. Again, MDC spent, we will spend 2.6. Deep would argue and has argued to me that the referring to MWRA uh, has spent $900 million to date. Well, here's the difference. Boston is not MWRA. Boston is Boston. Boston is a city, an entity that owns its own utilities, water and sewer, and they have a mandate of $500 million. MWRA is a separate entity. MWRA is a regional authority that serves 60 communities, including Boston. So they are actually serving as like a wholesaler, like Mattabasset is for us in parts of Rocky Hill. Towns send the sewer to Matt, uh, MWRA, and MWRA sends the water to these towns, but the towns own the infrastructure in their town. So MWRA comparison to the MDC, it's, there's no comparison. They serve 60 communities, we serve eight. I compared ourselves to Boston, not MWRA. Um, so I, I think that's important. Um, the other things that um, I, I wanted to talk about was, uh, in my email, I talk about what the MDC owes uh, to, to our member towns in terms of the groundwater surcharge. And Nick, can you go ahead? So in my email, I, there was a lot of discussion, and there was, a, there was an article, um, uh, some of the representatives went to a Newington town meeting, and they were basically arguing that, the, our state reps were arguing that, um, that they had talked to Deep, and Deep um, doesn't agree with our facts, and I line, uh, outline the facts in my emails. And there's also been discussions about, about you know, the $11 million, or now 13. So it's 11 million up till 2019, including 2020, it's 13 million. So the argument has been, well, we don't really want to talk about that, we want to talk about the water rate. Well, this is, this is an example of if the MDC received the $13 million in 2020 uh, of what we believe DEEP owes us, and our, not MDC, but our eight member towns, the yellow shows the, this would be the Avalorum charge uh, to our town. So we build our towns 51 million and change. We would have built them 38 million. The, the smallest um, uh, uh, revenue back to our towns would have been Rocky Hill at about $800,000. But, but Hartford and West Hartford would get back approximately $3 million. So it goes from $800,000 all the way up to $3 million. And 
these, this is real. You know, this is real money. So the argument would be, go ahead, Nick, to the next slide. The argument outlined in this, in this slide is, uh, and I'm sorry, my email is, they're arguing about, about what they're discharging and the fact that we basically arbitrarily raised the rate by 27 times. <clears throat> this is the landfills bill, okay? So this uh, here, these two meters here are actually the groundwater discharge meters, and this is their, actually wa their actual water meter. So what Deep would argue is that for years, we implemented this rate, this groundwater rate. It was 10 cents in 2007. We changed it in 2016 to 13 cents. <clears throat> uh, or, yeah, two, uh, 13 cents. What Deep would argue is for years, we were charging um, the sewer user charge, which is for non member towns. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's for nonprofits. So, state buildings, uh, municipal buildings, churches, anything that doesn't pay taxes, there's no way for the MDC to recoup the, the Avalorum tax uh, to pay ourselves back for providing service to that piece of property. So we have, and always had, a sewer uh, user charge for, for, uh, for nonprofits, and that rate, this is 2019, was uh, $4.64, okay? So <coughs> Deep would argue, Deep would argue that in, in up until 2016, the rate was approximately <coughs> $2.70, and we were charging the $2.70 per CCF for this groundwater. And they're right, that was wrong. We didn't, we didn't understand that until 2016, but really what we should have been charging deep was exactly what we had, which was at the time 13 cents for everything. And as of 2019, we changed and, and created a staggered rate. So now the first 25,000 gallons is 13 cents, the next is seven cents, and the next is fi five cents. So that took their 90,000 uh, average gallons per day and instead of it being a $4 million bill, it's now a $2 million bill. But what they're making the mistake of in their argument is that they're saying that we took the sewer user charge, which was $2.70 approximately in 2016, and basically changed it to this 13 cents. The answer is no. There was always two rates, two different distinct rates. We were charging deep the wrong rate. And we didn't go back. We didn't go back in time and say, we found this in 2016, but you should have been paying it in 2007. We said, only moving forward, we're gonna make these changes in your bill and we're expecting you to pay this charge uh, as everyone else pays. Now, so th this monthly total bill is approximately $178,000. Right now, we're only getting about $170,000 total for the year. Uh, Nick, give me one more. So this is Pratt & Whitney's bill. Now, Pratt & Whitney has a lot of water meters, so this is just their groundwater uh, uh, slide. But just to show the difference, the Pratt & Whitney has multiple ground meters, and they're charged the same thing, 13 cents, my point is, 13 cents for the first 25,000, seven cents, and then five cents. So they're getting charged exactly what we're charging deep. The bill is approximately $225,000, and they're paying it. Um, Nick, if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> There's 10 companies here, all that are paying this rate under this structure. Um, <clears throat> And the challenge that we have had has, and, and Pratt & Whitney is one of them, uh, we didn't realize until really 2016, give or take, uh, that they were even discharging stormwater and contaminated groundwater to our system because DEEP issued them a permit, as I referred to in my email, an individual permit, without our knowledge and understanding. So we didn't even have the opportunity to tell Pratt & Whitney, hey, you need to pay this rate. Triumph, same thing, 2014. We didn't even know 
that they were discharging. It wasn't until we got a call from Triumph, who actually bought out another company and said, hey, what's going on with this permit? And we said, what permit? And realized this individual permit was issued without our knowledge, without our signature. DEEP issues this permit. This is an individual permit issued by DEEP. All of these get a permit from DEEP. On the bottom of the permit, DEEP's forms, it says POTW, which is publicly owned treatment works, which is us or any wastewater treatment facility, we have to sign off on that. So when DEEP would argue, we didn't know that you had this charge. Well, every one of these permittees are getting charged this rate because of a, a permit issued by DEEP. The permittee is required to get our signature. We sign it if we're aware, and then we're charged this uh, this 13 cents, at 10 cents, 13 cents at the rate. So th this is just trying to counteract some of the comments I got back from DEEP over the last number of weeks regarding my email. And um, this is where this goes, I don't know, but, but the important part is, is that we're not charging DEEP anything different than anyone else on that chart. Um, and I think I'm going to leave that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for Does anybody have any else? questions? Alan? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there any reason uh, that we cannot invite someone from DEEP to come here and make a presentation in defense of this situation? We have. Uh, we asked uh, for them to come uh, to, uh, to a board. I can do that again, but we have asked for them to, we actually invited them. Uh, we'll in publicly invite them tonight. Well, they, they, this, was, this is being litigated. Yeah. As a result, the attorney general had recommended that they not come. Wasn't that it's, uh, yeah, we had, we had invited them. I think it was 2018. In fact, we invited them for the first time before the litigation commenced. Uh, I believe it was just after we filed with the claims commissioner. At first, uh, the commissioner at the time, Commissioner Klee, uh, had a scheduling conflict, and that was the reason why he didn't, uh, he couldn't come. And then I think he was advised uh, shortly thereafter by his counsel, by the AG's office, because of the pending state claims commissioner claim not to appear, and then subsequently there's been litigation. So it, 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 you can ask, but he's not going to, well, or she, excuse me, is, is not going to be permitted to show up. We, we did have a meeting <coughs> initially at DEEP with the commissioner and the commissioner's legal In the AG's team. office, yeah? No, the AG's office wasn't there. Well, that's the That was the, in, well, oh, yeah, the, the, the in embedded, okay. the embedded. Yeah. Uh, right, gotcha. Two separate. Legal. Right, and uh, I think, Buddy, you and I were at that meeting. Uh, at the uh, commissioner's office? Commissioner's right? office, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we ended up, uh, Bart Halloran and, and I met with, the commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, the attorney general's office, um, the OPM uh, secretary, mm -hmm. the, um, who else was there, the governor's lawyer. Um, there's a, a fourth party uh, there. I can't remember who it was. And we had, I think, two meetings <coughs> with them yes. and uh, got nowhere. Uh, we argued around the circle relative to what the issue was, and they were claiming we would create a major environmental hazard if we didn't allow them to discharge into the sewer, which wasn't the argument. It was a question that they had to pay as everybody else did, and we went through that. And then ultimately, uh, they ended up in a, uh, what was it, a, uh, an injunctive action. So we were out of that discussion. The injunctive action was filed. In and uh, Mr. Stone can explain that to you. Yeah, I, if I may, and this is part of the report that um, we we're going to give uh, next, but I'll, I'll get right into that. We did file the injunctive action uh, back in uh, late 2018, January 2019. It was met with a motion to dismiss from the state on the grounds of their claim of sovereign immunity. Uh, we had uh, briefing schedules, uh, reply briefs, sir reply briefs filed. Oral argument was in 
John, I think it was October of 2019. John, was it? Yeah. And then we received a decision from Judge Scholl on January 9th of 2020. We have, and I think I informed the board the last meeting, we have filed an appeal of that decision. There are parts of it which we think the judge, with all due respect, was uh, was incorrect on. And so we filed an appeal that's in its infancy, infancy stages at this point. We have filed a preliminary statement of issues um, for the, for the court as required within 10 days of filing the appeal. And before any briefing schedule gets uh, in place or any briefs are prepared, there has to be a, uh, a status conference or settlement conference with the court. So that's, we're waiting for that to be planned or scheduled. The second cause of action that's been filed um, relates to a, a separate uh, claim for injunctive relief directly <laughs> against the commissioner of DEEP to try to get around the sovereign immunity uh, defense that's been posited by the state. Uh, that is pending. There's also a motion to dismiss on that case. Uh, it's, we're right in the middle of the briefs on that case. We expect that to come up for oral argument within the next 30 days. So we'll obviously keep you informed on what happens with that case. On the claims commissioner side, and I, I know you've received emails from, from my office um, over the past several weeks. On the claims commissioner side, the claims commissioner had two years in which to render a decision on the matter. That two years expired on December 13th, 2019. They asked for an extension of time. We were not willing to give one. Uh, because the two years has expired, now the legislature will get a report. I, I believe it's due um, today, in fact. It's within five days of the opening of the session from the claims commissioner in which she indicates what cases have uh, have gone the two-year limit and she did not was not able to get to them for whatever reason um, she was not able to uh, address the claim so uh, the legislature will have that uh, probably by the close of business oh by by five o'clock today we will uh, we have submitted to the legislature your legislative delegation from each of your member towns uh, as well as the general assembly and as a whole in particular the chairs of the judiciary committee uh, two proposed resolutions. The first resolution, which were, uh, which the General Assembly has the authority now to act upon, is a resolution to um, validate the claim and direct payment. The second resolution is a resolution that would release the claim from the commissioner's uh, claims commissioner's office and give the MDC the authority to sue, which would get around that sovereign immunity defense that we've been uh, butting up against. Um, th there's two other options. One is they could uh, give the claims commission an extension. The other option is that they could deny the claim on the merits. Obviously, we haven't asked for either one of those things. We have met with the chairs of uh, the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we're op hopeful, uh, if not optimistic, that uh, they will act in, in our favor on one or the other. Obviously, we prefer payment, but the right to sue would be uh, would be. Uh, uh, worth worth pursuing as well um, and and uh, you have and representatives of your towns have also weighed in on that for us and and I've been hearing from legislators who have said you know we've heard from either the someone from Newington or someone from wh who, wherever but they've stepped up understanding the enormity of the of the matter and the in the fact that that they stand to benefit they have stepped up and 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 weighed in in our favor so Again, I'm optimistic that we'll get some result. Uh, obviously, we need that before the first Wednesday in May, this being a short session. Any questions? Um, buddy, didn't. Um, so you, you referenced the meeting that, that we were at uh, with Commissioner Klee and uh, practically his entire staff. I think I counted 18 people counting him, and there were five of us there. And um, that was in May, I think, or something. And then later that year, we talked about the possibility of closing a landfill, and it cl uh, sort of terminating the, 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 the discharges there. So the issue, I think, Chris did a great job just now of explaining it, you know, the, it's sort of technical. Uh, but the issue is really that DEEP is both the regulator of this what to do with this contamination, contaminated materials or whatever, and the violator. They're the ones that are violating their own um, regulations at this point. 
And if we, if we as, as the, the chairman was saying, if we attempted to stop receiving this uh, material from them, uh, that we might put ourselves in position of be, becoming a violator at the same time. Um, the issue for, for us is that right now we're, we're not. Uh, and, you know, uh, asking the legislature to sort of, they're not going to adjudicate this. They're just going to give us a path to go down one way or another or something. That EPA is really in, involved in this. So I believe that on the way from the landfill to the treatment plant, there are four CSOs. Somebody here from engineering, tell me if I'm right around, at least four CSOs. So four combined sewer overflows. So if there was some sort of storm event that, that, that was significant uh, and it caused those CSOs to, to, to dump out, they'd, go in, they'd wind up in the Connecticut River. Maybe one of them's in the Park River, gets pumped into the Connecticut River anyway. So we're all going to wind up in the Connecticut River. And at that point, I guess we'd both be <clears throat> liable, both deep and uh, the MDC might be liable for that. And uh, so I think that you know, the issue is really that um, not, you know, so much uh, historically, as Scott pointed out, like uh, what, what they were paying before, what they need to pay now. Um, the, the issue is, uh, uh, to me, a public health issue that if we don't do something about this, there's going to be a problem with this. There's, there's going to be a problem with this at some point if we don't do something about it. What's coming out of that landfill is almost pure ammonia. It's, uh, you know, if anybody's wondering if whether or not it's really dangerous or not, I'd invite you to go over there and we'll, we'll fill up a little eight ounce glass of that stuff and you drink it and I'll drive you to the hospital. <laughs> so uh, I, it's that serious, you know. So um, I, I think to let it go on for this, this much time um, doesn't respond to the fact that it's a real public health issue. And I hope that the, if the legislature is going to act, that they'll do it soon to either give us permission to sue or try to set something up where we actually uh, work with them again. But they never really spoke to us again after that meeting in May, and, and, uh, and they still haven't. Uh, it's just Scott occasionally, you know, uh, responding to some of their issues were, you know, they, like you, you brought up tonight. But nobody's really talked about what the ultimate solution is. And they could, I think, they could treat it there on the site themselves if they wanted to. Truck it. A treatment plant for 90,000 gallons a day could basically be prefabricated, put on a back with trailer truck and sent over there. And they could be doing it themselves if they don't want to, if they don't want to pay us. I just don't think that they want to be in the business of doing that. And I don't blame them. Uh, so I think that it would be easier for them in the long run to work with us and get it taken care of. But go ahead. Commissioner, Commissioner Sweezy. Yeah, oh. just sorry. In Rocky Hill a few weeks ago when uh, Jellison, Commissioner, Chairman DeBella, and myself met, the next day, some of you may have heard this already. I said it last week. But the mayor of Rocky Hill, Murata, called me and asked me what, you know, she could do. She understood that the state owes us money. She understood we need the integrated plan and we also need the funding to go along. <coughs> so we waited a couple days. Scott sent out a four page email to, the, like he said a few minutes ago. I met with the mayor. We put together a letter basically saying, on behalf of the Rocky Hill Town Council, uh, actually, I have it on my phone here. It says, uh, on behalf of the Rocky Hill Town Council, we write to urge you to support the two recent Metropolitan District efforts, namely the integrated plan and the $13 million. Anyone, I mean, this is so important. Like Chris Stone said, he's hearing from representatives. The town of Newington has uh, put together a letter voted by the council. The town of Wethersfield has... The town of Rocky Hill has, the letters are going out to our state senators, our state reps. I mean, the, the city of East Hartford could have, if we collected this money, can save a million and a half dollars from six million to 4.5. Uh, Rocky Hill's an $800,000. The city of West Hartford, $3 million reduction. So it's so important that you get to your mayors and we need the full funding in the integrated plan also. We don't just need the change. We need the funding. We can't lose that 40 40 percent, I believe. 40 to 50 percent. So, Scott, Chairman Dabella, 
I mean, they did a great presentation in Rocky Hill. The mayor understood what they we were saying, and she came on board within a few days. We wrote a letter. It's gone out to the, our state senator, our state rep. We only have a one state senator, one state rep in Rocky Hill. But it, it's so important that every other town comes on board and talks to their mayor or council members to get them on board. And if we could get every state rep, and uh, Chairman DeBella went to the city of Hartford. He was able to get the city of Hartford. They're coming on board with that, or at least the mayor. I'm not sure exactly. I don't want to misplace council. I state myself, but the mayor's coming on board. So, it, you know, we could have a lot of state reps and a lot of state senators supporting us getting this money. And the two plans Chris said, I mean, that's what we're going to need. We're going to need boats over there to make this happen. So. Further questions? Thank you. Alan? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to bring the discussion back to uh, the comments from Attorney Stone uh, and to thank him for that detailed explanation. And you referenced the, this uh, expected report from the claims commissioner. And so my question is only this. Can we then take that report, circulate it to our district's state representatives and state senators, and perhaps get a little action from them? Yes. We'll get that for you and we'll distribute it. I, I believe it's either, it's either today or tomorrow is the day. It's five days from the start of session. That's that right. was last Wednesday. So it's today or tomorrow, but we'll get that to you. A further discussion? If I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, Commissioner I've, Curry. I've been in contact with, our, with, with my legislative delegation, and, um, you know, they hear us. Uh, in fact, they, they told me they're a little tired of hearing from me. Uh, but the fact is, they also have had um, communications with DEEP. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're, they're hearing con some conflicting information. Um, they're not sure which is correct, which part of each is correct. Um, one suggested, well, it's, it's pretty easy. Just put, put MDC and DEEP in a room and mm -hmm. work it out. <laughs> um, but my question is, because we're in pending litigation, um, we, we really can't have such a meeting that would also include legislature delegations from well, the legislature can have participate. Le legislature can have a meeting with. They can, they can meet with obviously and they have they've met with deep and they have met with us separately. Uh, you're, you're not going to have a meeting um, requested by the le a legislator with both of us in the same room. Uh, we're not going to do that, and Deep's not going to do that. But all along the way, since it goes back to 2018, mid-2018, we've been willing to sit down with Deep, have on a few occasions with no result. And if, if the legislators want to uh, broker a meeting amongst the principals, which would be um, right. in, in, in furtherance of settlement, it'd be confidential negotiations, confidential statements. As soon as you get some, some third party in the room, you, you lose that. So um, the third party would be the legislator. They, if they want to broker a meeting and, and, and put us in a room and, and have us try to negotiate a settlement, just as we have before, we'd be willing to participate in that, I'm sure. So. Um, we did that so with far, so far it hasn't happened, and, and you're right, that's a good point, uh, Scott, <laughs> that we did that with CRA. We ended up achieving a resolution. Um, but, or if they want to go through some formal mediation, we'd be willing to do that. I mean, we're, we're not interested, with all that we have going on with, with DEEP, we're not interested in merely litigating and litigating and litigating the issue. It's not going to solve the issue for our towns in, in immediate, any immediate sense. So. If we've tried, in fact, we we went so far. You went so far as to modify your ordinance, where uh, that where this this discharge uh, fee applies. You modify the ordinance to reduce the burden. It wasn't just for deep. It had, it, there were others that were take advantage of that. But you've attempted to do formally 
what perhaps the legislators would like us to try to do informally, but we'd be willing to participate in that. As a follow-up, do we have any, has, does NDC have an obligation, um, and I raise this question because in, in, the, in the paper a few days ago, there was an article about the Farmington River that said, if you're catching fish to eat, only eat one fish per month, mm -hmm. but don't eat any if you're pregnant. Yeah. Um, so one fish per month is um, because of the PFAS uh, at, at the airport. Um, knowing what's flowing into the Connecticut River from the landfill, are we under any obligation to ask that Connecticut River be tested below those those, those bills and to notify? So, 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 Commissioner, to your question, the state of Connecticut DEEP and the state DPH, who are the regulators on water quality and, and, and illegal discharges to water courses within the state of Connecticut, those two entities are focused on the airport. <laughs> They're the ones who said to the airport, if you illegally discharge PFAS to the MDC's <clears throat> sewer system, again, you will be fined $25,000 per occurrence. The two regulators that are in charge of protecting all of us has yet to talk about the oh, PFAS man. coming from the landfill. Now, here's the problem. The PFAS is coming from the land into the Connecticut River in two ways. It's getting discharged to our pipe, and then it flows to the plant, and then because we have no way to treat it, it gets discharged to the river. And then the other way it is is that the seepage of the, the way in which the landfill is built and the way the dike is built, the dike, as I, as I presented at one of our, my meetings, our meetings, board meetings, the water is allowed to flow through the dike, right? That's why there's footing drains that collect the water that come from the water side onto the land side of the dike, and then it flows to uh, the discharge point, which is the North um, uh, Meadows Pond, which is the, store, the, the drainage uh, uh, system for the storm system. So if the landfill is roughly 100 feet higher than the dike, when the landfill is full of water because of rain, you would think the hydraulic pressure would be able to go the opposite way, right? Be able to push water from the, um, from the landfill into the aquifer of the Connecticut River. So why isn't DEEP and DPH concerned about DEEP's argument? They have said publicly in the Hartford Current, the number one source of PFAS is landfills. But yet we've heard nothing from the regulators about PFAS and coming from the landfill into our pipe, into the plant, and then discharge. I, I agree with you 100%. The question is, why isn't DEEP concerned about that PFAS but the concern about the PFAS coming from uh, fire protection foam. That occurs once every 25 years. When the PFAS is coming into the Connecticut River every day from, from the landfill. And I ask because on good days, my wife and I walk the river and we see, every day we see, we see fishermen. Some are sports, they're, they're catch and release. Some are catch and keep, because uh, they are. Some are catch and keep because they need to supplement their income, but they're they're taking this fish home and they're eating it. And they, they're unaware of, of you know, what, what's happening to, the, to those uh, living creatures that are in, this, in the river, Connecticut River. We agree with you. All right. But I, I believe it's a DPH and deep is, DEEP's regulations. <laughs> if you go to uh, deep, DEEP's website or DPH's website when it comes to fishing, they, they clearly show on their website um, for example, PCBs, forget about PFAS, PCB oils. Um, they clearly tell you on Deep's website where the fish are and what fish you shouldn't eat. And they're very uh, systematic about PFAS, I'm um, sorry, about uh, PCBs and how many fish you should eat over a given year or given month. Uh, but we agree with you. They should be the ones telling the public uh, uh, and making them aware south of the Farmington River. Going to come Michigan East, Flint. Any further discussion? If not, uh, could you proceed to, with your report? 
He's done with his. Unfinished. Okay. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we're on. Yeah, I, and, and that's all. I don't have anything more uh, for, the, for our report. What you, what you received from uh, Mr. Mr. Stone was uh, what he just gave you was coming next. So Yeah, the, the, the real um, important, pen, uh, another important pending matter, excuse me, is the uh, item number nine, which we'll get into yeah. when you put Okay, uh, item number nine, uh, potential settlement of pending litigation, uh, Petzoil and MDC, possible executive session. Is there an executive Please. session? Do you want to take the executive session at the end? I have uh, outside counsel here, Mr. Chairman, okay. so if, if you, if you okay. don't mind. Okay. I don't, I don't think it's going to take too, too long. Right. Is there a motion uh, to go into an executive session? Do we go into executive session? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, who do you want to stay? Okay. Where are we going now? Go ahead, Ray. Water Bureau, a bureau approved uh, A, B, and C at its last meeting. Are there any dis any questions? These are um, service ins ins uh, installations, uh, licensing on the reservoir. No further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my only concern is, and while I'm, I'm not asking they be separated, um, State of Connecticut is one employer. Lots of different agencies, but still one employer. We're in litigation with that employer. Um, you know, approving anything for the state just kind of. <laughs> understand that. But I will support this. They're, they're easements, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The easement. Easements. <laughs> further discussion, no further discussion. Um, all in favor of a. I'm sorry, Billy. I'm it's consolidated, but we need somebody to move all uh, three of them. I'm sorry. I asked without objection that they be consolidated, and there was no objection. So they're before us. Oh, it's all three. to move all three? Well, yeah, I, 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 moved I moved all three. I moved, and I oh, okay. said I without mean, objection I that, the, that it would add. Okay. This would be for A, B, and C. It was moved to consolidate all three of them together. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, 11, Board of Finance consideration and potential action regarding reallocation of certain bond proceeds. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Uh, is Chris going to talk about this? Chris? Okay. Buddy? Yeah, I would say that at the uh, Board of Finance meeting on February 3rd, this motion was passed unanimously. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, we did have a conversation about this at that, um, <clears throat> at that meeting. This goes back to uh, uh, projects that began in, um, some, some that began in 2017. And uh, some of you may know that when we, we borrow money for clean water projects, <clears throat> we do so in the form of short-term interim funding obligations. And then when we, and we were able to draw that money down from the state, um, you know, uh, as, as we need it, we draw it down, and then we permanently finance that in a project loan obligation, which is a 20-year repayment. On our GO projects, we have, uh, you can see in the audit, there's four pages of projects listed, and um, the 110 million was, at the time, an estimate of what those projects would cost, and I believe there were um, over 100 projects involved, but inevitably, when you complete projects, you find some projects, even based on best expectations, uh, were, were, uh, were either completed or not completed. I think the example that uh, Susan gave me most recently of a project, uh, we bonded for a, a project on Oakwood Road where we were going to replace a pipe. It turned out that we were able to line that pipe. Therefore, the, mon the, the funds borrowed on, for a permanent financing were able to be freed up and reallocated to other projects. So. Of the 110 million, this represents about 2 million in projects that were reallocated for reasons like that. I think we could actually, you, you, there's probably a story about each one of those, whether they went forward or they didn't, but, but it's a relatively small percentage. And it's one of the reasons why uh, when we borrow for CIP projects, because we can't draw money down like we do from the state for clean water projects, 
we try to be very careful about sizing those borrowings and, and being pretty sure we're reimbursing ourselves as much as possible for things that have already been done. But obviously, we're trying to minimize our, our cost of issuance. So I think that. Chris, can you just clarify in these circumstances? Uh, so we've done a lot of things to, um, to try and avoid this from occurring. Uh, with new procedures for example we're asking staff engineering staff when we look for monies instead of look for the entire authorization from the board we're looking for just the design piece up front so we have a real guesstimate estimate prior to coming back to the board and getting you know the, uh, a wrong amount requested <coughs> um, but also <coughs> this money is not actually in most cases not actually bonded it's just an authorization right so we're, we're, we're changing the authorization, but we actually hadn't bonded the money, and it's not cash sitting there. Right, right. so there's, there's, there's more than one explanation here, but I think one of the things that we're doing in uh, uh, coordinating better on, on projects going forward, we're trying to minimize the amount of, of costs that we incur when we borrow, so that we don't want to be, there was one year when the district was in the market five times in one year. And obviously the issuance costs are very considerable. So to the extent that we can uh, reimburse ourselves for costs already incurred, we lessen the, the, the instances in which we have to reallocate. Um, but I would say, you know, this is a fairly small reallocation to have to do. But in the grand scheme of things, you, you, you don't always have perfect information about what you're going to need to spend and when you're going to be what you're going to, and when you're going to spend it so you you make um, the best judgment possible and you try to minimize uh, the potential for for these things to occur so this is a relatively minor reallocation when you consider it was a hundred and ten million dollar um, set of projects Commissioner Salemi yeah I think I just would add I think to to what Scott uh, was saying was that these are these are authorizations, so the project hasn't actually been done yet. There are authorizations to do a project, or may have not have been bonded are, yet. Yeah, and you, excuse me, and you, you said like for instance, one of them was sort of the subject of a value engineering thing, and said, wait, wait a minute, you know what? We can reline this pipe. We don't need to replace. We don't need to excavate. We don't need to rebuild this. You know, we can reline this pipe, and so the the actual allocation goes down because you're only relining it. And, uh, and then the, the, there's a balance of funds there that from the authorization that what we're doing here is moving it to a project that needs the funds rather than leaving it in, in there and then just exactly it later. Yeah. Yeah. So rather than ask for $5 million in our CIP request at, at budget time, we're going to ask for the design piece first so that we, we, we can do our due diligence in the field and not have to come back and say, well, we didn't need $5 million, and now we need to reallocate it to some other project. Yeah, you can use the design to, do the, to, 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 right. to uh, basically improve the quality of the estimate to, right. to yep. do. So. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? OK, item number 12. Committee on MDC Government, consideration and potential action regarding, uh, we've got to take these separately. Um, a, appointment of legislative con uh, consultants. Is there a motion? Move it. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, discussion? Mr. Chairman, uh, it was the case that uh, this item passed unanimously after a brief discussion. Any, for any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Item B, revision of the 2020 non-member town capital improvement surcharge. Uh, the action, is there a motion to adopt? Second. Moved and seconded. Again, this item uh, was passed unanimously after a little bit of a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, want, <clears throat> I want to understand from the administration that basically I looked at it and most of it goes down. I know the bottom line, what we receive will be the same. Simply distribution changes. The question is that why did we select, if we have total choice, that two-inch pipe in Farmington should go up as much as it does? 
-hmm. how many people or how many customers are impacted in each case. Most of <coughs> other people will be charged less. Yep. So um, just to clarify, so the mistake that we made uh, was we did not bring the proper uh, chart uh, in the budget process. So when you look at the, uh, the, the resolution, you're looking at what was approved last month yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what we're proposing today, and it shows a significant difference between the two-inch meter, right? But that's really not the issue. The issue is if you look at 2019 rates, there's still a major increase in the in, in the two inch meter. It's just it's it's more under this proposal. But the the here's the reasons why there's difference. Every town, non-member town, pays 100 percent of the capital investment in that town. Every town investment is different, and every town has different. Like for example, in Glastonbury, uh, we might have three customers with a two inch meter, and in Farmington, we might have ten. So every town has its own calculation uh, because they have to pay. There's only so many customers in that town, yeah, and they have to pay 100% of that CIP. So it gets divided evenly, but based on meter size and based on max flow within that meter. I so every town's a little different. I understand that. What I want to know is that when you choose particular size, what was the logic behind it? AWWA standard. So, so the industry says the, uh, a meter. The center. What is the hydraulic? Hydraulic. Oh, well, AWWA is, is the is uh, American Water Works Association. So they are the standard, uh, just like uh, NFPA is to the fire protection system. They're the standard of the industry for water meters, mm -hmm. and they basically say that your meter, um, if you're flowing X through that meter, you should be using parameters that that meter can properly uh, record and if you and just for if you're using a thousand GPM then you should be using a certain size meter versus too small too big you're not going to properly capture the flows because every meter has its own efficiency based on its size and its flow so this the standard is based on the industry by AWWA rich and towns have no input well, I'm looking from perspective of public relation that you please eight people and maybe 800 people with two meters are displeased. Yep. So you we took take so a we look will, at the numbers. If if the when the board approves uh, the rate, uh, we have our letters already drafted and written, and they will go to the town manager. Um, and we copy the town manager and our commissioners, our non-member towns, to explain exactly how the rate was calculated, what it's based on, meaning how much capital investment was made in what year, what projects, uh, very specific information so that they can see what the rate is for its town. Thank you. Rich? Uh, Commissioner Vint. Excuse me. The way, the way I read it, it looks like in towns outside uh, the metropolitan district, for which capital improvements or layout of assessment projects are constructed. It, to me, it doesn't seem to address existing. It looks like what's going to be a capital improvement or new construction. I get confused when I read this. Do you want to talk about that? It, it's for, for any project that was completed, so it has to be completed, it has to be accepted by, by the MDC and the board. So once that project is completed, then we are able to charge uh, the CIP uh, for that project. And it's a cumulative, right? So if you're bonding for 20 years and you have so many projects, and as, you, as you pay off bonds, then a project drops off. So an existing built project that has a two-inch meter will get this new charge. Mm -hmm. it, a, a, if, if we spend $15 million in Glastonbury on pipes, infrastructure, um, new improvements, whether it's pump stations or it's water main on Kimberley Lane, that, that investment, once that project is completed, everybody in the town, so there's 5,800 customers in Glastonbury, their CIP charge, and they have that CIP charge on their bill right now, and that will that new project that gets accepted will be at the debt service will be added to that CIP charge in that town. Oh, just simply, 
projects built, this is the new rate for an existing project also. It's a meter. Two inch meter. We're using the meter size, Commissioner, right. to decide how much you pay of the, of the CIP cost. Okay. Understand. Um, one other question. Um, if you're using the CIP, it's how come numbers divided by certain areas only go up to four inch meter and certain areas go up to six and eight inch meters? Why isn't uh, Glastonbury stops at a four inch meter? Is there a reason? There's, there's no six or eight inch meters yeah. there. In Glastonbury. Yeah. Okay. And was there a, one last question. Was there a public hearing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We had actually two public hearings because we made a mistake. We and so we had to yeah, correct that. We calculate yeah, and have another public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Commissioner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up to that question, if Glastonbury doesn't have uh, six and eight inch, and tomorrow they do, what what rate will we charge them? I, I apologize. My attorney was whispering in my ear. It, it would be calculated for the 2021 budget. For the next it would be budget. calculated for the next budget for 2021. In 2021. Yeah, it's based on the capital improvement that will be done in the 2020 fiscal year. If there's no meters in the larger meters, not, they wouldn't be in that calculation. I guess my question is why don't we set the rate for the towns for all the different diameters of pipes, whether they have it or not? Because the way it's calculated, if, if there, it was based on the volumetric, the hydraulic capacity of each meter within each town. So if you have 10 <coughs> six inch meters in one town, and then you drop down to five, that's going to affect the rate. It, it's, so the, the amount of flow f flowing through those different size meters will affect it. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? What's that? Is there some? Is that a <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, what item? Am I in? Thirteen. Item thirteen: Personnel Pension and Insurance Committee consideration and potential action regarding pen pension plan amendment one-time retirement payee. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Moved. It's been moved and seconded. Mr. Um, Chairman, this was is this approved. Buddy? Who's, oh, I'm sorry, is it Al? Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, this was uh, discussed <coughs> and uh, approved in PP and I. Discuss I discussion, but that was the one time one payment. One time payment, yes. Yeah, which we had to bring back and yeah, recalculate. We voted on it twice. We had to bring it back. I What's it? Bob or, oh, Bob's here. What's it? I'm Bob sorry, time. Bob, he's up there. I didn't see him. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Okay, so th this uh, goes back to our pension plan. We don't have a cost of living adjustment built into the plan. Uh, March uh, or May of 2018, on behalf of the retirees, a request was made. Last time we did such a review and such an adjustment was 1998. So we bounced up proposals uh, all the way to the full board, and then they bounced back to the Personnel Pension and Insurance Company. So November, uh, they actually settled, settled in on a resolution and approved it, and it would be based on the last date of adjustment. So it read, uh, people that retired before January 1st, 1999, and they had to have $1,500 gross monthly or less. So based on the census that we used, January 1st of 2018, we saw that there were 22 uh, people eligible, 22 retirees. We excluded beneficiaries, we excluded alternate pays, we excluded those types of files. So in the process of fine-tuning that, um, we discovered some people had died since that, that census was published uh, through Milliman. So right now we're at 19, uh, so it'd be $1,000. It doesn't go towards their pension. It's a one-time cash deal only. Um, and um, we're, we're set to go. It would be coming out of the pension fund, $19,000. Discussion. Uh, sure. just, just to put it in perspective, uh, we've got 19 folks. Uh, if, if their buying power 
was $18,000 in 1999, with the average cost of inflation at over 2% a year, that buying power today, 20 years later, is like $8,200. Uh, so the $1,000 uh, is, it's really, it's nice, but um, I, I know the members of PPI have agreed to come back and revisit this. Um, and I think you're all given a handout tonight <coughs> listing uh, 10 or 11 more retirees that, uh, that fall under the under 1600, 1700, et cetera. Um, and I'm hoping we'll have a, uh, a long term, better long term solution to uh, addressing the needs of our retirees. Uh, you know, we felt it was important we stay with the defined benefit plan or a hybrid maybe. Um, which I concur with, uh, but 20 years later, these folks uh, can use a little assistance, and I think I think we owe that to them. Commissioner Hall. Well, well I agree. It, it seems like it's a nice thing to do. Typically, in contracts, if they're saying we're not going to give a cola, there's some other benefit that they might have received that could have more than, you know, compensated them over that same time period. So I would think we would need, or maybe you've, it's already been done, we've gone back and examined those contracts to see was there anything that they received in exchange for not getting the COLA. I think the only thing they got was a watch into 25 well, years. Yeah, well, actually, the, the, the one thing our retirees uh, did receive prior to the last change was um, when you retired, obviously you receive medical. And uh, your, when you retired, whenever that is, your premium of your, of your medical is, is frozen. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, right? Yeah. So, so, you're, so if you retired in 1999, whatever that premium was, a family medical plan today cost the MDC approximately $25,000. A uh, family medical plan in 1999 probably cost a lot less than that. So whatever that premium was, you, it's frozen at time of retirement, and 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 uh, that's all you pay. But as but as you you age and you're a retirement, the MDC picks up the delta between what you retired at. So there is a benefit uh, that our. Uh, 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 not to your point, Commissioner Curry, that it, it probably doesn't compensate uh, like the state. They have a COLA, and they've been averaging a 2% COLA for a number of years. Um, but there is some benefit of our retirees when, when they retire on the, on the medical premium. Well, and just to elaborate, there's, once they become eligible for Medicare, uh, the district reimburses the cost of Part B um, and that's where the recent negotiations, we've stepped that down for new employees. Uh, it won't be available for dependents or, or spouses once they retire in the future. Uh, but that's a significant benefit. Commissioner Sweezy. Also, what Scott was saying, we also gave that benefit to the spouse. So they the took that away from the new employee. The spouse also got the benefit, which in the last contract, we, all, we also took that out on new employees. New employees, when they retire, their spouse will not Recover. get that. Uh, the surviving spouse. Which is going to be about a 40, 42, 45 million dollars savings, savings to the district over, over the next 25 years. 25 years. Good. Further discussion? Not all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Item 14, Thank Bureau, you. Bureau of Public. Bureau of Public Works consideration and potential action regarding request of Connecticut Light and Power doing business as Eversource for an easement over district property located at 231-255 Brainerd Road in Hartford. Is there a motion to adopt? It's been moved Second. and seconded. Rich? We had this on our agenda on the 3rd of February and it passed unanimously by the Bureau of Public Works. It's an easement across Brainerd Road, right? Discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> Let's 
see. That's the end. Huh? Recommend Item 15, opportunity for general public comments. Hello, Val Rossetti from Bloomfield. I wanted to come back this week because last week there was some discussion about drought regulations and the Niagara bottling discounts. I just wanted to clarify that um, although the MDC can talk to Niagara or plan with the DPH, your own brochure states it has no authority to prioritize water use during drought triggers. It also states, which is true for the water supply plan, that there wouldn't be any mandatory industrial limitations mandatory until the reservoir was at 10% of its level. So a lot of folks have trouble with the idea of even being at 75% drought trigger, being, you know, getting down to 53 and being told don't water your lawn, don't shower, municipalities cut back, but still we have up to almost two million gallons of water being used to bottle and ship water out of the watershed. So normally when water is transferred out of a watershed, it needs a diversion permit because it's leaving one watershed to another. But when you ship it out in bottles, that's not true. And if the MDC, I would just say, if we're so certain that there will never be a drought where residents are subject to drought provisions, I don't really understand why it was such a incredibly vigorous lobbying effort against state regulations, which just would have said, for water bottlers, there should be a renewable permit consistent with the safe yield that gets adjusted over time with climate conditions. And that if drought triggers are hit, water bottling shouldn't be shipped out of state. That's one issue people have with the Niagara discounts. I don't have much time to talk, so I wrote this up, but it's been presented publicly that this is a great deal because residential rates will decrease by 10 cents per CCF. But what's being neglected here is the income that you're potentially losing by giving this discount without a necessity for it. So for your information, if you had voted for this discount last year, you would have actually lost the MDC money. Niagara Bottling got a permit for its third line in October of 2018. The line's up and running. There are no permits for a fourth line. So you, you run the risk of actually losing money with this discount if they don't increase their water bottling. And when you look at the actual revenue that the MDC could gain without a 20% discount for water and an up to 75% discount, on the clean water project charge. It's $4.7 million versus two and a half with the discounts. So you're essentially giving what I consider a corporate giveaway of about two and a half million dollars every single year, which may not be necessary and is likely not possible. And I'm using the figures that Mr. Jellison used in developing the 10, per, 10 cent discount, which is that Niagara would somehow- Time is up, please conclude your in, Yeah, would, would increase their water use by 1.2 million gallons a day, which I don't think is likely, but consider, consider the corporate handout that you're giving and the, and, and you're, you're basically <laughs> pinning some of MDC's revenue hopes on the water bottling industry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Judy Allen, West Hartford. I submitted some written comments and I did it in a hurry and I didn't edit well, so it's not my best work. Um, I'd like to speak about the proposed no discounts for Niagara. So far, Niagara has been using water that can be handled by two lines of bottling out of the possible four lines they would need to use um, 
in order to use the maximum 1.8 million gallons of water a day. The amount they use varies from month to month, but overall, they have slowly been using more. There is no evidence that Niagara needs any incentive to use more water. If you provide Niagara a discount on water they intended to use anyway, MDC loses revenue. Niagara is a successful profit-making business. They do not need discounts to make a profit. They will use whatever water they need. They won't build another line just so MDC can sell more water. Um, Mr. Jellison repeatedly says if Niagara was using up to that 1.8 million gallons of water, our rates would decrease by 10 cents. You have no idea if and when a fourth line would be built. Their use goes up and down and will never get to 1.8 million gallons of water per day for an entire year. The 10 cent reduction for water rates just won't happen. Um, but Mr. Jollison says the only way to keep rates down is to sell more water. And we know that's not true. You just reduce the rate by three cents by making cuts in the recreation budget. There are many things that affect water rates. For some reason, your staff has been unwilling to look at a rate structure structures successfully being used by water utilities throughout the country to address the same loss in water consumption that the MDC faces. That's a long-term solution. In the Bloomfield Messenger, Mr. Jellison says, build it and they will come. So we are going to create a rate that will encourage them to come. The MDC has no authority to determine what industry should be encouraged to come to Connecticut, especially one based on how much water they use. In Bloomfield, they may be questioning the wisdom of expanding Niagara as heavy water-laden trucks and their exhaust eats up roads and destroys air quality. Do you want Connecticut's roads and air quality to suffer while MDC creates a mecca for the water bottling industry? What happens when Niagara doesn't use 1.8 million gallons of water a day? What happens if no new businesses are attracted? In the uh, Bloomfield Messenger article, Mr. Jellison says the responsibility is yours, the commissioners, not his. You are the ones who vote. When next year comes around and the rates are not reduced by 10 cents, what will you tell customers? The responsibility is yours. The proposed discounts are unfair and won't solve the problems you hope they will. Ray? Yeah, under commission questions. Water Bureau about three weeks ago passed a resolution on economic development rate. We had to bring it back after Public Works passed it a week ago. We adjusted it to what Public Works had. My question is, when is the public hearing going to be set up so that we can move forward with this up or down, whatever the vote is, but we need a public hearing so we can bring this back in March. Uh, to, uh, I believe you need a 10-day notice. I understand John's working on it, but can we get it done? Yes. It, it will be, uh, that's government, right? Government. Government committee. John, okay. take care of it. But, so we'll get the hearing in the next few weeks? We're, we're working on a microphone issue at the training center because we expect a large attendance. Um, but the goal is to definitely have it done by the end of this month. I spoke to Commissioner Hoffman tonight about dates, um, and Good. it should be available prior to, uh, well, we need a government meeting before the board meeting, uh, so that would need to be squeezed in as well before the night of the board meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Salemi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you know, for it's been quite a while now that, uh, you know, I've been listening and to and uh, reading uh, comments from both um, Judy Allen and uh, I also have this written comments from Valerie Rossetti. So I, I appreciate you putting them in writing. And, you know, I, I think one thing is clear, and in, uh, I think, Judy, you say it in your, in your uh, remarks, but you didn't say it when you spoke tonight, is that, you know, the real depressing factor on water sales is not the water rate. Our water rate is... It's one of the best water rates in the state. So it's not the water rate itself. It's the clean water charge, the clean water project charge. There's no doubt in anybody, shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind 
that $4.10 on top of our water rate of $3.97 cents is it's more than the water rate itself. Okay, so, and I think that um, it's it's not a, for me. It's not a question of just offering a discount to a large user. For me, it's it's finding a way to not charge that if it's if the water is in fact not going down the drain. Okay, so at, at Niagara Bottling Company, I know you, you said it's going in a bottle and it's getting shipped out of here. Could you but direct that's, direct your comments to the board. And yeah, but I'm just saying that that's private business. I just want to make sure I'm, they understand. I'm trying to respond to what they said, mm -hmm. but the the. Uh, uh, so it's going on a truck and it's getting chipped out of district. I don't think that that make that makes no difference to, to, to me whatsoever. Once we sold the water, we sold the water. We have a control over it after we sold it. So whatever they do with it, they do with it. But if it's not going down the drain, uh, if it's basically getting using to, to water a golf course or a cornfield or something like that, and it's not going down the drain, then we should find a way for that for them not to have to pay the clean water project charge with that. And just to say, well, we're going we're gonna to collect uh, less revenue, yeah, that may be true and, and, you know, that we might collect less revenue for the clean water project. However, you know, I would rather be collecting it in a situation where it's fair, where we're charging it fairly, where it's meaningful, and it doesn't belong on the water rate. The clean water project charge should not be tied to the water rate. And uh, so you have some big users like golf courses, or um, you know um, farms. There are there's still some farms in the district that use the district water, uh, and other places you know that where the water is not going down the drain, so it's not becoming an issue for the water tr or the sewage treatment plant. It's it's basically getting shipped out somewhere in a bottle, or it's going into the ground and making corn grow. So I think that we really need to focus on that. And I also would add, and I've said this. Before that, if we make this, if we if we do find a way to to discount the <coughs> clean water project charges, uh, and, and it has a relationship to how much water actually goes down the drain, then we should do that for residential uh, uh, um, customers as well. There are some 15,000. If I got that wrong, Scott, you're going to have to correct me. 15,000 people with irrigation systems. 3,500. I thought there were, I thought, what, what was the 15,000? 12,000 is the number of backflow prevented devices that we okay. are responsible yeah. okay. to DPH. So that's essentially, you don't have those unless you have uh, an irrigation system for the or, most part. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, there's other, there's other reasons why fire protection systems, um, you might have one <coughs> property that has four devices in it because it's medical or some other rationale of uh, cost right, so, contamination. So we're looking at the ones that actually have irrigation systems or like my house, I don't have a fixed irrigation system, but, but I do like to water my lawn because I you know, spend a lot of money on making it look nice and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people do. Uh, that you know you could set a rate that has a maximum amount. Um, so right now the average amount uh, for uh, a residential customer with a 5 8 inch meter is something like uh, 80 CCFs or, a year? It's four, $410 per year, approximately. That's 100, that's 100, 100 CCF. CCF right. That's 100 CCFs a year. And I, and I, I thought it was more like uh, uh, you know 80. But let's say it's 100. So that anybody that uses o over 100 with a re for a residential customer with, you know, uh, that's using it for irrigation, they shouldn't have to pay more than four, $410. And think about that. How long are they going to have to pay that $410 a year? How many years are they going to have to pay? That's your share of the clean water project. And, you know, I figured it out. I mean, it's, it's you know, thousands. It's like a second mortgage on your house. You're going to be paying this for a lot of years by the time it's we get done up. with it. It's going up. So the, the thing that I explained in my email You're going to be paying more than it's $4.10 $4 today. We still have to spend another billion dollars and that's why it's very important when I compare ourselves to New, New Haven, Bridgeport, and Norwich, is that we've already spent $1.7 billion, which is costing our customers $410 a year. We still have to spend another billion, and oh. that's going to raise that rate from $4.10 to upwards of $7.50 approximately. So it's going to double. Even if we get everything we agreed to with DEEP and the integrated plan and get all the grant and loan money that we expect, it's still going to double. And yet, Norwich has done nothing. Bridgeport has spent 20 
to $35 million, and we've spent $1.7 billion, and yet we're not, very good, and yet we're not, you know, that, that's what we're looking for relief. I mean, we're saying, Deep would argue, well, they have consent orders, yes, but you haven't forced them to do anything yet. Yet we are forcing us to spend another billion dollars um, where we've already spent 1.7 billion. It's 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 not fair to our customers. Well, I did this simple math, and just just so I mean, with the 2.6 billion, uh, somewhere in 2.6 billion dollars, the number of residential customers we have that are paying the clean water charges is only 90,000, not 102,000. Right. So only 90,000 people are paying to clean up all of Central Connecticut. You will have paid about $17,000 towards that. If you, if if it just goes the way that it's going now, you will wind up paying about $17,000 per household to to for the clean water project alone. Nothing else, just the clean water project. And the issue, but with selling more water, is not necessarily trying to make water cheaper. The water would be less expensive if the MDC were what the people that founded it and envisioned it to be, all the communities within 20 mile radius of the state capital, we don't even have half of those communities as part of the MDC. And the truth is, as long as we have a clean water charge, no one is ever going to join the MDC again. Truthfully, New Britain, Manchester, both of communities, that's another 100,000 people that would be part of the MDC. But just those two communities are well within the 20 mile radius. Uh, but we, we just lost, uh, last year or the year before, Scott, uh, Avon Water Company, the Connecticut Water Company, Avon is well within, it's, in, it's less than 10 miles. So Avon is well within that, but their water company was sold to Connecticut Water <laughs> Company, a private water company. And a year before that, Yukon, with the potential for 2 million gallons a day, we could have served Yukon in our franchise area, and Yukon went to Connecticut Water Company, which the state of Connecticut will pay more. That water rate is going to be more than what ours would be by to three, UConn. And to they wouldn't two, be five. paying, UConn wouldn't be paying the clean water charge. So okay. anyway, okay. that's the real issue. We don't have enough people in the MDC to pay for these projects. So. Okay. Commissioner. Patel. I have two questions. Question one, a lot of numbers are being thrown back and forth including from administration as well as commissioners, that we will break even and a rate will go down to 10 cents. That has to be pro given in writing black and white, how explaining before the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So public can understand and we can talk the same statistics <laughs> and we can also understand with the same statistics. So we got to share that information <laughs> ASAP. Agreed. The second question is that uh, you sent us the article at EPA, of a New York Times article. Yes. And towns are fighting going to new EPA, which is now Trump's EPA, which doesn't care for pollution, etc. My question is, us guys, with the cooperation of all member towns and even public plebiscite, we should determine do you want to go to that route and say, we are not, we don't want, please, we are not go spending anymore. Mm -hmm. And if that's what region wants, if everybody wants to deal with that, then a lot of problems will go away. We will have no discussion for another 25 years. Thank you. We got, next. We got the questions. Um, I'm sorry. Commissioner I'm Hall. Sorry. Hall. Yeah, Commissioner Hall. Thank you. Um, I'd like to request that we consider West Hartford Town Hall for the public hearing. I think there's a lot of people in West Hartford and Bloomfield that would be interested in going. We have West Hartford Community TV right there in the building. It would be a good thing to air. Um, it's also not always convenient for people from West Hartford Bloomfield to try to get through Hartford at the 5 o'clock time frame. Um, and I would suggest we, we started off with a little explanation of some of the challenges because not everybody watches these meetings. And if we could combine that in with the public hearing on what we're trying to accomplish, it might be helpful. Hartford's more centralized relative to um, populations from East Hartford and 
Weathersfield, Rocky Hill. Could that's, we have more than one? That's up to the committee. Um, that's why we picked the training station right. when we talked, Scott. I mean, the training station is 91 to Bloomfield, 91 right there. Plenty of parking. Rocky Hill right there. The Berlin Newington comes right up the Berlin Turnpike. West Hartford goes 84 to 91. Tremendous parking. I mean, it's it's an ideal location for Bus every service. town in the district. <laughs> East Hartford comes over the bridge. They're there. <clears throat> Um, I think one, you know, you have one public hearing. If you have a hundred people, that's fine. You have two hundred people, that's fine. But I don't think you have to keep this going and going. We've had people coming to meetings for the last month talking on this. We've heard, and then it will come to the board whether it's for or against. Takes that decision, right? Uh, okay. The committee will. Right. The committee, uh, the committee makes that fine. decision. Okay. I'm sorry. Let's see. I got Alan. Then I'll be back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to um, address something, and I, I just uh, want to be sure that uh, no offense is taken. It's not intended at all. Uh, I very much appreciate when we have uh, members of the public who come in, and especially those who prepare the remarks, which are always very good, very carefully uh, written and uh, and points well made. I received this from Judy Allen, who spoke tonight uh, before I got, uh, before the meeting started, and I read it. And something uh, disturbed me about it, and it, uh, it was simply this, that I read it again a second time, and then I started paragraph by paragraph, and I inserted the words buy and sell instead of use. We don't think of Niagara as using the water. They buy it. We sell it. It's a perfectly legal and clear, appropriate, appropriate transaction. So it's not a matter of just letting someone use it or use a little more. We expect to be paid. That's what we do here. That's our business. So I don't really feel badly when we have these discussions about the use of water, the discounted rates possibility, and so forth. And I just want to go back to uh, one meeting ago, and I just wanted to make it clear to the rest of the board that during the, um, I believe it was a Water Bureau meeting, uh, Commissioner uh, Taylor made a, a very clear, passionate, and, and important uh, statement that made it clear that much of the water that we have in our system gets lost in the fact that we have to dump it. We can't sell it. It's, it's gone. We, we put it into the Farmington River or wherever, wherever, it el wherever else it goes. And so I just wanted to, uh, to make it clear that if anybody uh, did not hear what um, Commissioner Taylor said, uh, ask him because he makes it very clear and very simple. Uh, and I appreciate that, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Cardo. Yes, the, uh, in, uh, Mr. Jellison's uh, letter to the, uh, to the towns, he talks about the windfall for the $13 million that is, that is owned by, uh, to us by the, by the deep. Um, if they did pay this amount this year, okay, what would each of the towns get next year with that uh, two hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars a month? What is? I'd like to know what it would be divvied up to because uh, Mayor uh, Rell uh, is asking that question. Is if they do pay up, what is the ad valorem amount that would go down um, if the numbers stayed the same for 2021? 
okay, in, in going forward. So I believe the board has already passed the resolution, and it's passed every year, that if we receive any money, whatever that is, if it was mid-year, the money would... You want to know the amount. Yeah, no, the, what I, I understand... You want to know fall. you want to what? know the amount the net amount that we, we had a, no, no like sure. let's say they the decrease, uh, the decrease going forward if the 13 million dollars was paid what would it's about what, 2 million dollars it's it? it's too many a year understand that divide that by the eight member towns no you take the percentage no, of the town well that's what i'm saying the yeah. the, the percentage the two, of the 2 town. million as as in budgets this budget cycle we had told you that 1% is approximately $500,000. So if you're receiving $2 million in revenue from someone and it's being applied to Avalorum, then you're talking about approximately 4% reduction year after year. Yeah, but I guess the question was what the gross amount of money, the $2 million would be predicated on the formula we have and the percentage. We can give you the percentage. Yeah, what's that, what's, what would Weathersfield get? What would Rocky Hill get? What would that, West Hartford get? You would get your percentage. So your percentage, uh, uh, West Hartford, I know the number in my head is 23%. So they would get 23% of $2 million. Um, um, Har Rocky Hill is, you know, so the percentages are. We can give you the printout. Yeah, we yeah. got a printout. Because, yeah. because this chart here, that, that's. That was, a, that was yeah. cumulative. You're that's asking cumulative. for it a year to year. Year to year. Yep. Commissioner, we'll give you that. Yep. We got a printout. We'll just yep. divide it I, by I, the. I know percent. I have it someplace yep. in my. In my we yeah. can give you that. Yeah. Yep. If you look at, I'm sorry, if you look at the two page um, summary that we've given out to all the towns, and if you don't have it, Nikki can give that to you. In that, it also has a chart and it shows the percentages. Uh, of Avalorum by town. By town. Right, that's Nick. really what it is. So the yeah, percentages with the two that, million. Yep. That's what we need. Yep. You got it. We'll, get, we'll give you the yep. printout on it. Yep. Um, Thank you. There was any commissioner? Yeah, I was just <laughs> want to know. Uh, maybe it's Mr. Zykes can let me know. But how many employees are eligible for retirement this year? I know over the next five we have a substantial. Like, over 200. Uh, not this, this year, but over the next five. How many this year? Bob? We have the magic number, age and service, so they can go out without... Bob, could you, could you make that uh, pronouncement for... Did he say 60? The microphone. Right, right now, uh, we have 60 uh, that have magic number. We have approximately mm, 10 to 15 that are already 65 years. That's the normal retirement age. So you're looking at a pretty good number. We're estimating 30 to 35 retirements for this year. 2020. Last year we had 19. Year before we had 17. And once we get into 2021, it's it's the sky's the limit. It's going to be over 150 retirements. Thank you. Any further questions, Commissioner Taylor? Just yeah. Yeah, clarify, I, not retirements, I, I, potential retirements, right. because right. that could be misconstrued. No we don't have 60. You don't have 60. Right. You don't have. 120. That's the potential, that potential. pool. Right. <laughs> Eligible. Right. Commissioner Taylor. Yeah, I, I had the unique experience Sunday of getting in a shouting match <laughs> with one of the constituents uh, uh, in my town, Bloomfield. Uh, and it was readily apparent to me that I don't think we have clarified the issues with regard to what we're doing. There is a considerable amount of confusion. I think that, uh, that uh, uh, the commissioner, a fellow commissioner down here, when he addressed the issue about the clean water project uh, and what it's doing to the water bills, there is considerable confusion out there about water bills and the clean water project. And when you ask Absolutely. people, what are you paying, and have you looked at your bill, they just go blank. Uh, because you ask someone, how much are you paying for water, and what else is on the bill? They give you a blank stare. Then you ask them, and, and maybe I was sort of baiting the, the person because I asked them, I was so angry. Uh, at that point, I asked them, well, how much do you pay for cable? And the person told me they paid, I think it was $250 a month. Yeah, $230, 250 yeah, you know, and at that point I said, well, look at it this way. If we shut off your cable, 
what happens to you? I mean, you'll probably go stir crazy in your house and with your family. That's one thing. But we shut off your water and your sewer. <laughs> Uh, just think about that for a minute. Toilet gets shut up. You know, people, uh, I just, I think we've just got to lay it out better, and I'm not quite sure how we do it, uh, but we've got to do that because, uh, first of all, we're on a course where we may have to go out for more money, or as the commissioner said, uh, we vote not to do it, but. I would suggest that you be careful about that because we are under a consent order and they can always take us back across the street. Am I wrong, counsel? That's absolutely correct. And if it goes back to cross the street, then the judge runs it. And that's a different matter altogether. That so, was mentioned yeah. in the article that many okay. uh, yep. towns in New we York get, area. Can we go through the chair rather than having conversations back and forth? We got the article here, Commissioner. New York Times article, which came in our package. And many cities and towns are going to EPA. All these negotiations, all agreements, they want to dump it. And the, I, I know I, we don't want to go. My point is public should know if that is the choice we have. We ask public, let, raise that level, so let them know that, yeah, whether feel cold, we'll have dirty water there for months, or Bloomfield will have this effect. We, do you want us to stop all this? And that will raise the issue, and they will know exactly that, yeah, I, I'm get, get, getting benefits from the, whatever we are doing. Because if the people don't see the benefits directly, like watching TV, watching, the, making phone calls, etc. because water comes in. And nobody knows. So at some point in time, we have to raise that issue and have a discussion. Let people know about it. Most of the, most of the benefits of the Clean Water Project are pretty much downstream. Yes. It's downstream in the Connecticut River, and it's downstream in the uh, Long Island Sound. So most people really don't see it unless you spend a lot of time either down on the Sound or on the river. Uh, but you know, and as, as uh, Commissioner Salami has said, uh, Salami. Salami has that said basically, we're getting hungry. We've got 90,000 people that are responsible for cleaning that, that up, and that's just not bearable yeah. given the yes. situation that and we're faced with. All I'm saying to you basically is I think that we've got to do a better job of laying it out uh, so that people can understand very clearly what it is they're paying for. And one last thing is that, you know, we talk about discounts to people like Niagara or to heavy bottled users or heavy water users, but yet and still we're dumping pretty close to 35 million gallons a day uh, in the Farmington River that goes out you know, into the Connecticut River. It doesn't even stay there. So, you know, once again, if we're talking about discounts on water and giving it away, we're giving it away to the fish for nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, uh, that's one of the issues that we've got to seriously look at is breaking the specific clean water sh charge out so that people understand what they're paying for, not en encapsulated in the, in the water bill. Rich? May not be a good suggestion, but we could issue two two bills. That's uh, well. Let's have that discussion in committees. Right. We'll be here all night. Right. Any further discussion? If uh, Don, thank you, Chairman. Just quickly, the screen that was just up with the ad valorem fees. Uh, I would encourage everyone, all the commissioners. Uh, if you haven't got it, ask Scott to it's, it's in the, uh, take your phone, take a picture of that page, and send it to your legislators not to their government contacts, send it to their personal contact. They're inundated now with the session coming in and new bills. They've got so much to read that they're not going to see all Commissioner, if I, if I may, it's in the email, and so you have it, and the legislators were copied on it as well. I know, but they, yeah. went, they went to their, their You want to bring it, bring it to their attention. They may or may not see sure. everything yep. or one, but they may see it if you send it to their cell phone or their personal email. All right. Any further questions? 
If not, uh, the proper motion is in order. Oh my gosh. So moved. Okay. And accepted. Oh, <clears throat>